Hey, thank you for tuning in. Uh, before we start, I want to give an introduction as this is going to become a series on the channel that has a very different format from previous series. So I like all kinds of American history. I love telling the tales of the past of the United States of America, but my bread and butter, I've kind of neglected the past year on the channel, and that's the French and Indian War. If you don't know what the French and Indian War is, well, uh, it was part of the International Seven Years War, which many consider to be the first true world war. You're probably wondering, wait, how have I not heard about a world war before the first world war? Well, people got more interested in the world wars of the 20th century and kind of just went, who cares about the world war when we had fl uh, flintlock muskets? Let's talk about the world war with the very fast shooty things. So it is my bread and butter because I live in the Pittsburgh area and Pittsburgh was ground zero. It was the epicenter for what triggered the Seven Years' War. And there were many different battles fought around where I currently live. And I have done videos in the past on it, but I've never really been able to do it in the detail I want to. That all changes as we're going to do a series where we deep dive into regimental histories of several of the units involved in the French and Indian War. And first and foremost is going to be the Virginia Regiment. And the reason I'm doing this introduction is this is not going to be a video of me talking in front of a camera. There's probably not going to be a lot of visuals. The French and Indian War, since it has now become an obscure conflict, there really is a lot of good images to describe it with. So this is going to be an audio heavy series, but I hope you stay through the rough formatting as there's a lot of good information I want to get out that a lot of people may not be familiar with. And if you are familiar with it, I'm hoping this will be a good way of can making it all the information concise. So without further ado, uh, stay for the video, a lot of good information. And if you like this series, like what you're seeing in this series, hit the like button down below to let myself know and the algorithm know. And if I don't see those likes, well, then I know I'm doing something wrong and have to fix it. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop delaying. Here is the regimental history of the Virginia Regiment and the French and Indian War. Virginia, like many of the British American colonies, was protected by militia that could be called to arms when needed. French encroachment into the Ohio River Valley, where several influential Virginians had land claims through the region, made Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie consider the entire colony in jeopardy. He pushed for the House of Burgesses to meet in February of 1754 and authorize raising 400 men-at-arms to establish a fort at the Forks of the Ohio. The House voted in favor of 300 men-at-arms, fearful a larger number would be difficult to outfit. The Lieutenant Governor also promised 200,000 acres in the Ohio Territory to be reserved for the men then enlisted in his growing regiment. Three distinct commands took shape by March of 1754. The first was a small detachment organized by Captain William Trent that hurried to the Forks to erect a fort under the banner of King George II. The second would amount to 160 men-at-arms commanded by George Washington, newly commissioned a lieutenant colonel through the colony of Virginia. The third command consisted of an additional 100 men-at-arms commanded by Joshua Fry, a mathematics instructor at the College of William and Mary. Fry was commissioned a colonel through the colony of Virginia and was expected to be the superior officer in the field. The regiment was in poor shape from the start. Though militia law required all men to bring their own firearms to the muster, many were unsuitable for military operations. When firearms the colony of Virginia had stored in its magazines in Williamsburg were Dutch imports or secondhand weapons from London. The clothing of the men at arms was equally deplorable, often wearing what was on their backs at muster. Washington advised that the lieutenant governor purchased the necessary material to make uniforms that would consist of red coats and silver cuffs like British regulars, but only a small portion of the regiment will receive these by the time they were on the march. Trent's command was successful in reaching the Forks in April of 1754, meeting with Tana Cherison, a member of the Seneca tribe and a half-king amongst the Iroquois Confederacy. Washington and Tana Cherison had formed an alliance the previous winter, providing the Virginia Regiment with a small contingent of native warriors to support them in exchange for Tana Cherison having exclusive trade access at the Forks. But just a few days in construction of what Trent declared as Fort Prince George, the arrival of several hundred French soldiers compelled Trent to abandon his position. Washington would rendezvous with Trent at Wills Creek, present-day Cumberland, Maryland, 
hoping to maintain the support of Tana Cherson, Washington decided to move the regiment to a place known as Great Meadows and await the arrival of Colonel Fry. In late May of 1754, Washington was made aware by Tana Cherson that a French party was approaching the Great Meadows. On the morning of May 28, 1754, 30 Virginians commanded by Washington and a dozen warriors commanded by Tana Cherison engaged 35 French soldiers helmed by Ensign Joseph Coyon de Jumonville. The 15-minute skirmish would lead to much of the Jumonville's command being made casualties at the cost of one Virginian life. It's generally assumed Ensign Jumonville was killed by Tana Cherison with a tomahawk a move that would have far-reaching consequences not only for the Virginia Regiment, but the entire world. In June of 1754, Washington received a hundred more Virginians and nine swivel guns. Colonel Fry was not present, for he had died during the advance in a horse-riding accident. This made the 22-year-old Lieutenant Colonel the superior officer of the Virginia Regiment. The unit began working on a stockade, christened Fort Necessity, to protect their supplies. Washington received further reinforcements in the form of 100 soldiers of the Independent Company of South Carolina and was promised more help from other British colonies. Despite this news, Tenet Sherrison's faith in the Lieutenant Colonel's capabilities were running dry. He and his warriors abandoned Fort Necessity by the end of the month. On July 3, 1754, the Virginia Regiment were in the thick of the Battle of Fort Necessity. Captain Coyon de Villes, brother of the slain Jumonville, commanded the franco amerindian force that numbered 600, outsizing Washington's 300 Virginians and 100 Carolinians. A rainstorm made many of the regiment's outdated firearms useless, while the French commanded by Captain Coyon de Villes were kept dry in the forest. The only thing keeping the French at bay were the swivel guns, which were overseen by then Captain Adam Stephen, a Scottish immigrant and physician by trade. By dusk, the French offered a parley, which the Virginians accepted. Washington's command, including the Virginia Regiment, suffered 30 deaths and 70 wounded. The French dictated terms of surrender, which were translated by Lieutenant Jacob von Braun, a Dutch naval man and one-time acquaintance of Washington's half-brother. Several key details were lost in translation, including a declaration that Washington was guilty of assassinating Jumonville. Unaware of this detail, the lieutenant colonel accepted the terms and departed for Virginia with all but two of his men the following morning. The surrender at Fort Necessity would be a catalyst to have France and Britain to go to full-scale war in just a few years' time. In the wake of the events at Fort Necessity, the Virginia Regiment became scattered between Wills Creek, Winchester, and Alexandria, Virginia. They briefly came under command of Colonel James Ennis from North Carolina, who planned to control all colonial forces sent to aid the now-failed campaign. Winchester and Trent returned to Williamsburg to de debrief the lieutenant governor, who was disappointed but not entirely discouraged. It was hoped the combined colonial forces of New York, Virginia, North and South Carolina could make another advance upon the Forks. But the rapid progress by the French in constructing Fort Duquesne and increased desertion amongst the Virginia Regiment snuffed out such ideas. Elements of the Virginia Regiment rioted in Winchester in the absence of a Virginian commander. In the fall of 1754, word arrived from London that regulars were on their way to the colonies. The Virginia Regiment was to be broken into independent companies, reducing Washington's rank to captain so as not to conflict with British commissioned officers. In response, Washington resigned his position of the regiment. The start of 1755 saw the remains of the Virginia Regiment supporting the 44th and 48th Foot, the two regular infantry units that formed the backbone of General Edward Braddock's campaign against Fort Duquesne. This consisted of six ranger companies, a light horse company helmed by Captain Robert Stewart, and two companies of artificers commanded by Captain George Mercer and Captain William Polson. The average number per company was 50 men at arms. Cloven for these men were in flux, for the red coat of the previous campaign and blue coat soon to be standardized were both present on this march. George Washington was also present for this expedition, but not in command of any of his colony's companies. He volunteered his aide-de-camp to the general, hoping to gain new insight on the machinations of the British Army. On July 9, 1755, the forward brigade of Braddock's army traversed the Monongahela River nine miles south of Fort Duquesne. 
including that column was Stewart's Light Horse Company, Polson's Company of Artificers, and the Ranger Companies of Captains Thomas Wagner, Adam Stephen, and William Le Pironi, the latter of which was a French Protestant that came to identify Virginia as his homeland. At one o'clock in the afternoon, the vanguard of the bridge column was fired upon by a franco amerindian force. Chaos erupted within the British lines, as the retreating vanguard and advancing rear guards smashed into the main body. Attempts by the Virginian companies to push into the forest and outflank the enemy led to friendly fire. After three hours of futile fighting, the Major General had fallen mortally wounded, handing command over to Washington. Using the Virginian companies as a rear guard, Washington evacuated survivors to the south side of the river and retreated toward Fort Cumberland. In what history now remembers as Braddock's defeat, three companies of Virginians were virtually wiped out with an estimated casualty figure of 60 individuals. Captain Polson was killed in the action, Captain Le Perone would die of his wounds, and Captain Stephen was wounded. In the wake of Braddock's defeat, the shattered remains of the 44th foot and 48th foot were put in command of Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dunbar, who departed the Ohio country for winter quarters in New York. Without any soldiers defending Virginia's frontier, an outcry for restoring the Virginia Regiment arose. In August of 1755, George Washington was commissioned colonel of a unit the House of Burgess voted 40,000 pounds in paper currency to fund. The hope was the regiment would come to consist of a thousand men at arms, with an additional 200 rangers that would create and occupy fortifications on the most extreme limits of the colony. Recruiting the necessary manpower proved troublesome. Though Washington had requested the possession of a pay chest on campaign, paper currency was instead sent irregularly from Williamsburg. Paper money was often refused in neighboring colonies, making it difficult for the average Virginian soldier to acquire necessities. Desertion was rampant, leading to the assembly passing laws making the act punishable by death and grave punishment for civilians harboring deserters. By the end of 1755, the Virginia Regiment consisted of approximately 500 hardened veterans from the previous campaigns, but also raw recruits with no better alternative than to freeze in place at Fort Cumberland. 1756 brought much contention over the strategic objective of the Virginia Regiment. While Governor Dimwitty expressed aspirations for another campaign into the Ohio Territory, Washington knew without the proper strength in numbers and supplies, this was not a realistic goal. Of the thousand men the Virginia colony were willing to pay, less than half were present for service. Nevertheless, in a move to gain new indigenous allies, several of the regiment's companies were sent to aid Cherokee warriors in raiding the Shawnee who were living upon the Big Sandy River. These companies were commanded by Major Andrew Lewis, an Irish immigrant that had excelled at farming and surveying prior to the war. Uncertainty of the passages to the Shawnee towns, as well as the harsh winter, made the expedition futile. The remainder of the regiment worked to improve Fort Cumberland and erect a chain of ranger forts along the south branch of the Potomac River. In spring, Shawnee and Lenape war parties ravaged the Virginia frontier. Warriors led by Kilbuck clashed with the Virginia regiment in the trough, as well as Ashby's Fort. The most noteworthy of these skirmishes transpired on the 18th of April, involving Virginians helmed by Lieutenant John Fenton Mercer. In mere minutes, Mercer and much of his party were ambushed and laid dead near Fort Edward. The raids drove Virginian soldiers into their ramshackle outposts or outright desert for safer havens. The situation grew dire that several in the ranks were tried by court-martial on the grounds of cowardice. Even as the raiding party slipped back into the forks of the Ohio, both soldier and civilian of the Virginia frontier were in dire disarray. Arguments between the colonies of Virginia and Maryland persisted over whose responsibility it was to maintain Fort Cumberland, an outpost whose locality was distant from Virginian communities. Colonel Washington sought to consolidate the power of the Virginia Regiment by establishing a new fort at Winchester. While the colony's assembly argued over how to fund such a project, Governor Dimwitty approved it so long as a contingent of the regiment remained at Fort Cumberland. The train of artillery which Dimwitty procured for the fort protecting Winchester was numerically impressive, with ten cannons arriving before the end of 1756 and more on the way. But the fort's sophisticated cribbed wall of wood encasing sod complicated construction. 
Colonel Washington simply did not have the manpower required to build such a defense in quick order. On December 1st, the service of the draftees expired, leaving only a skeletal crew of volunteers to garrison the unfinished fort through the winter. Even in the face of deteriorated conditions, both within the ranks and back in Williamsburg, Washington strived to keep the regiment's discipline as close to British regulars as possible. By the end of 1756, many of the soldiers were outfitted in blue frock coats with red cuffs tailored in London. They were rigorously drilled within the parade grounds of Forts Cumberland and Loudoun. It was Washington's hope if the regiment had the discipline of regulars, the Crown would incorporate them, as well as, as, well as rewarding Washington with a royal officer's commission. He appealed to associates of Fort Loudoun's namesake, John Campbell, 4th Earl of Loudoun, and recently appointed commander of North America. Washington at last got his meeting with Campbell in March of 1757, but was most distraught by the results. An appeal to include the Virginia Regiment amongst the regular establishment was swiftly denied, due to a lack of confidence in Washington's leadership following the Jumonville Glen Affair. Instead, Campbell ordered a detachment of the Virginia Regiment to be put under the command of Colonel Henry Bouquet for a campaign in South Carolina. Washington would be left with only 400 men to continue the construction of Fort Loudoun and garrison the frontier outposts. Washington would never seek a promotion from the British Empire again. The colonel's pride being hurt was the beginning of a clerical nightmare for the Virginia Regiment. Multiple times throughout 1757, the quota for men and officers changed because of the colony's hamstrung funds. Competitive pay from the 60-foot Royal American Regiment of Bouquet's command enticed several officers and volunteers away from the Virginia Regiment. This initially was demonstrated in a lackluster recruiting drive that spring, followed by increased desertion. Attempts to appeal to church congregations to not shelter deserters fell on deaf ears. Washington ordered anyone found guilty of desertion to be lashed a thousand times, the legal limit. Then, on July 28, 1757, two soldiers found guilty of desertion were executed by hanging in front of the regiment and Winchester civilians. The drama of desertion, pay, and unfulfilled threats of assault strained the health of both Dimwitty and Washington. The lieutenant governor announced his resignation, while the colonel became stricken with dysentery. Washington placed the regiment in temporary command of Captain Stewart in November of 1757. His physician had advised him to remain out of public affairs for the duration of the winter. 1758 brought change to both the Virginia Regiment and the American colonies. The Ministry of the British Empire became more proactive toward the conflict in North America. Secretary of State for the Southern Department, William Pitt, advised a new economic strategy in winning the war, which saw Britain send monetary support to their European ally of Prussia, while material resources would be distributed to the front lines and other theaters of conflict via the powerful Royal Navy. For Virginia, the colony's assembly were informed that they would only need to worry about raising, paying, and clothing their soldiers. Colonial officers would also have their rank recognized of equal value to the royal commissioned officers. Colonial support of the war was further improved by sensationalized accounts of the Fort William Henry Massacre. The accounts assisted recruiting parties trying to fill the quota for the Virginia Regiment. With some of the financial burden resolved, the Virginia Assembly voted to raise two regiments. Colonel Washington returned to Fort Loudoun in April to take charge of the 1st Virginia Regiment, while an additional 600 soldiers would make up the 2nd Virginia Regiment, led by Colonel William Byrd. Byrd's name was well regarded in the world of diplomacy, having represented the colony in maintaining an alliance with the Cherokee that would become beneficial to the campaigns against the French. He also brought with him the baggage of gambling, struggling to keep his personal financials in order. The men-at-arms of the 1st Regiment varied from disciplined veterans of previous campaigns or passionate new recruits spurred on by want of vengeance. The 2nd Virginia Regiment were predominantly made of men green to combat, necessitating several officers be shuffled from Washington to Byrd's authority. This included George Mercer to the protest of Washington. For the first time since Braddock's defeat, the British Empire would make an offensive against Fort Duquesne. Brigadier General John Forbes moved to Philadelphia, beginning to organize an army. Key to this force would be the involvement of the Virginia regiments, representing the most experienced frontier fighters they'd be at his disposal. 
For this campaign, Washington instructed the 1st Regiment to store their uniforms in Williamsburg, opting to don them in hunter shirts, green wool leggings, and breech clouts, a style dubbed Indian dress in correspondence. The 2nd Regiment adopted a similar dress code, donning prized French clothing. While the appearance of the Virginians impressed Forbes, politics would distance himself from their colonel. Forbes advanced west out of Philadelphia, traversing Pennsylvania's leg of the Allegheny Mountains. Midway across the colony, he ordered the construction of Fort Bedford as a point of rendezvous for forces from Maryland and Virginia. Washington spent the spring and summer opening a road between Cumberland and Bedford, but also clearing Braddock's Road. Washington and several in the ranks of the Virginia regiments hoped Forbes would use the established approach to the Forks. Publicly, Washington argued the approach was more practical, but privately, the desire to safeguard land grants from 1754 remained. Washington repeated appeals to move the army south agitated the general. As the two commanders argued in correspondence, a Virginian work party constructing a supply road near Bedford grew quarrelsome with the army's quartermaster, leading to Adam Stephen being arrested on grounds of insubordination, a charge later acquitted. Against the hopes of the Virginian regiments, Forbes maintained an approach to the Forks via Pennsylvania. The Virginia regiments would be represented in all free engagements of the Forbes campaign. First came the failed reconnaissance of James Grant. On the morning of September 14, 1758, a party of 800 men commanded by the Scottish Major attempted to raid the storehouses outside the French fort. The British position was soon surrounded by the franco amerindian garrison. Major Andrew Lewis attempted to reinforce Grant's position, which soon proved unattainable. Thomas Bullitt, captain in Virginia Regiment, succeeded with his company in creating a route of escape for some of Grant's command off the battlefield. Elements of the Virginia regiments were present at the British Supply Depot of Fort Ligonier when it was raided by French and native war forces, numbering 600 men-at-arms. The Virginians, along with the rest of the garrison, were driven into the fortifications, but held the ground. The final engagement of the Forbes campaign would prove to be the Virginia regiments most disastrous. By November of 1758, 5,000 British soldiers were encamped at Fort Ligonier, including Washington and nearly 1,500 Virginians. Upon word of an enemy war party approaching, Washington sent Lieutenant Colonel George Mercer with 500 of the 2nd Virginia Regiment in pursuit. When Mercer did not send an envoy to update Washington, the colonel led a portion of the 1st Regiment into combat. In the fog and darkness, Washington and Mercer's parties began firing upon each other. Dispute continues over who discovered the error, though Washington later recorded he raced between the firing lines to knock up the muskets. The Virginia regiment suffered 40 casualties because of this friendly fire incident. Though Forbes was dissatisfied by the performance of his army, its strength in numbers was enough to compel the French to abandon Fort Duquesne. Washington was given charge of the brigade that first arrived at the ruins on November 25, 1758. Shortly after, elements of the Virginia regiments assisted in burial detail of the dead from Grant's defeat, as well as interring the skeletal remains from Braddock's defeat. With these matters sorted, Colonel Washington resigned his commission with the intention of permanent retirement from armed service. With the Forks of the Ohio now in the hands of the British, the Virginia Assembly modified the structure of its military. The 2nd Regiment was dissolved, though the 1,000-man quota remained for the 1st. Colonel Byrd assumed command, though his marital life was showing signs of distress. Byrd was not alone with personal drama, for Lieutenant Colonel Adam Stephen became marred by accusations of drunkenness and financial mismanagement. A fissure in the Virginia Regiment's chain of command was becoming obvious. Washington maintained a presence over the unit as a member of the House of Burgess, supporting efforts by Lieutenant Colonel Mercer and Captain Stewart in land speculation. Stephen competed by creating a partnership with Captain Bullitt to acquire Ohio lands on their own terms. While the commanders of the Virginia Regiment competed, the matter of maintaining the Ohio Territory remained. Companies of the Virginia Regiment escorted convoys of supplies across Forbes' Road in 1759. In May of that year, a party commanded by Captain Bullitt were ambushed three miles east of Fort Ligonier, an incident that brought further criticism from Washington. Robert Stewart, now holding dual commissions in both the Virginia Regiment and Royal Americans, attempted to hold Fort Loudoun together, 
By 1760, the garrison had 166 men with its siding walls. Stuart was in want of musketry equipment to maintain the garrison's firearms. Instead of receiving supplies, he was ordered to assume the responsibilities of his royal commission, taking a detachment of soldiers north of the Forks to build a British outpost on the former site of Fort Michault. Tensions were building in land southwest of the Old Dominion. Miscommunication had led to the murder of several Cherokee warriors at the hands of Virginian settlers at the end of the Forbes campaign. This was the last in a chain of events occurring on the frontier that fragmented the Cherokee, with war parties attacking the backcountry of Virginia, North, and South Carolina. Colonel Byrd was instructed by colonial and royal officials to prepare to intervene as regulars and Cherokee war parties clashed in the Carolina backcountry. But his prior history of the Cherokee made him hesitant to act. Emissaries from the Cherokee were received by Major Lewis at Fort Chiswell, but were forbidden by their superiors from engaging in negotiations, at least at that time. In the summer of 1761, a portion of the Virginia Regiment advanced to the Long Island of the Holston River in present-day eastern Tennessee. Fort Robinson was constructed with the intention of being the supply base of the campaign into the Cherokee lands, coincided with a royal expedition for the Tennessee River Valley. The Virginians, however, would not see combat. Byrd resigned his post in September, leading to Stephen assuming charge of not just the regiment, but ongoing negotiations. The Virginia regiment successfully facilitated a treaty with the Cherokee people, a precursor to the end of the Anglo-Cherokee War. Stephen authorized Ensign Henry Timberlake to lead a small party into the Holston River Valley, stopping at multiple Cherokee villages to recite the negotiations. Timberlake would later accompany Chief Austin Ocko on his visit to London to meet with King George III in 1762. With hostilities in North America nearing a close, the Virginia Assembly planned to dissolve the Virginia Regiment in early 1762. Efforts were made by Adam Stephen to maintain some semblance of the regiment during Pontiac's war the following year, writing to Colonel Henry Bouquet of being in the process of raising a thousand militiamen to support Fort Pitt in the wake of the Battle of Bushy Run. Although native raids would persist on the Virginia frontier through 1764, the Virginia Assembly entrusted future forays into the Ohio country be conducted by the regular army. Well, if you're seeing my ugly grill again, that means you've made it through the history of the Virginia Regiment. Now, this was a little bit bare bones. What this video was designed to do was to give you all the major events and major players of the Virginia Regiment during this massive conflict. The Virginia Regiment, I believe, served the longest of all the colonial units in the French Ain War. They were organized in 1754. They're mustered out somewhere between 1762 and 1763. So they served almost a whole decade of the conflict. So a lot of ground to cover. Just want to hit the cliff notes. As in future installments in a series, we're going to go through the biographies of several of the officers and key soldier, soldiers involved in the Virginia Regiment. So we'll be talking about Adam Stephen. We're going to be talking about William Byrd. We're going to talk about George Mercer. And I can't wait to talk about George Mercer. He is a highly underrated figure in the creation of George Wa uh, creation of Washington's legacy as we know it today. So we're going to talk about all of them figures in detail in future episodes. Hey, thank you for staying through. I hope you enjoyed this first episode. And I hope you stick around for the rest of this series as we dive into the regimental histories of key units in the French Indian War. The first modern world war. If you like this video, be sure to hit the like button down below. If you have something to comment, maybe there's part of the history I got wrong and I'm willing to admit I am no I am not perfect at all when I when it comes to reciting history. Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to see follow this series, subscribe to the channel. Subscribe here to read out productions. And if you want to help wake me up in the morning, want to give me a bit of monetary support, you can go to my Kofi link in the description below and buy me a cup of coffee. I've gone through about two cups this morning, and actually that's not too bad, finishing this video. Well, I'm going to stop delay, and I'm going to let you get on to, with your lives now. Enjoy the rest of your day.